Hey guys and gals, um, just wanted to take some time and uh, record a video here for you because unfortunately it looks like I'm not going to be able to come in. I'm still in quite a bit of pain from the from the Achilles surgery and I just I can't move around very well yet. Yeah, kind of hard to move around when you got this big old lugging thing hanging off from you and it, it hurts every time I move it. So I'm going to probably take another day or two off. So I figured what I'd do today is uh, I'll record the lesson ahead of time. You guys will watch the lesson, you'll take your notes, and even though I won't be there, I ask that you please keep track of any questions that you have, and um, set those aside, because I will be back at the latest on Wednesday, so we'll plan on um, taking care of some of those questions on Wednesday. Alright, so uh, our next topic is hair and fibers, so let's go ahead and, and get rolling with hairs and fibers. So, um, I'm going to help you out with the note-taking, some of these slides are pretty text-heavy, so, so bear with me. Um, the biggest thing you need to know about hair you know, for this particular portion of the slide is the fact that it's one of the most common forms of trace evidence. Right, typically, it's going to involve the identification of hairs and then comparison or doing comparisons of those hairs to other hairs that were found at the scene of the crime and that were uh, taken as control samples as well. And we're typically going to take advantage of the use of a microscope when we're working with this. So when I come back on Wednesday, we'll get the microscopes out and you guys will get a chance to take a look at some of the hairs under the microscope. All right, the first thing we're going to do when we examine hair that's found at the scene of a crime when we bring it back to the lab, we got to figure out, first of all, where did it come from? Did it come from an animal or did it come from a human? Right, and there's certain features of the hair that we can look at for being able to do this. And so we can take this hair then, and once we've started examining it, we can use it to help show that somebody was linked to the scene of the crime, or it can also be used to exclude individuals from being linked to the scene of the crime. And you can see in this little bottom part here, um, an example of exclusion is when dog hairs can be associated to a particular breed, but they can be identified as belonging to a particular um, particular dog. So the important things here with this slide is the stuff that's in the red. Here is one of the more common forms of trace evidence. Identification of question hairs is going to occur in your comparisons of the known hairs. You're going to first try to identify, is this a hair that belongs to an animal or to a human? And we typically don't use hair evidence to, to make a match anymore. We just use it as more corroborating evidence to help back up some of the stronger evidence that we already have. All right, so when we're looking at hair, we should get a general idea of the biology behind hair. All right, hair is a result of a protein called keratin. So this is an important topic that I, or concept that I want you to make sure you, you take note of. Hair is composed of the protein keratin. All right, it is also, keratin is also the primary component and protein that you find in your in your nails as well. All right, so most of the color of your hair though is due to pigments that can be turned that are either turned on or not turned on, and then uh, this is going to cause so that when light reflects off from the hair, certain things, certain wavelengths of light will be absorbed based upon the pigments that are present, and other wavelengths will be reflected, and that ends up being the color that you actually see. So just remember from physical science. You see colors because of reflection, not because of absorption. The colors you see are being reflected off from an object. The colors you don't see are being absorbed by those objects. All right, we can also look at the shape of the hair. It can be more round or oval, and when you see cross sections of the hairs later on, that'll make a little bit more sense. You can look at the texture of the hair. That'll often tell you more about the body location, where the hair would have come from. And um, it can also tell you about whether people are chemically treating their hair like a perm or... Um, bleaching as well. All right, and so then, like I said, we can also use some of these identifying characteristics to determine the, the body part from where that may have come from. So important things on this slide is hair is composed of a protein called keratin. Keratin is also the primary component of fingers and toenails. All right, you see the color because of pigments, and um, you get these optical effects because of light reflecting and bouncing off the surfaces. Right, hair shape and texture is um, influenced by your genes as well. So those are the big three things I want you to get from this particular slide. And if you need to pause the video in order to get all those before going on to the next, hey, um, make sure you do so. So when we look at how a hair actually um, is getting made, when you look in your skin, you have these hair follicles. Right? And there's this layer of cells here within the follicle that actually produce this keratin. And they produce it, and it gets pushed into the, the hair shaft. And then as that continues to collect more and more and more, it causes the newer stuff to be towards the bottom, the older stuff to be towards the top. And it keeps continuing to push the older stuff out to the surface. Kind of like you think about soil. Things get compacted and compacted because more and more is going to be 
at it all the time. Well, instead of the older stuff being on the bottom, the older stuff for your hair is actually out of the surface. All right, and so um, it's going to extend from the root or bulb embedded in the follicle, and then it can, it's going to continue into the shaft here, and then eventually it's going to terminate at a tip, which is going to be outside the skin. All right, and I'm not too worried about the anatomy of that. A good close-up there with showing the, the hair coming out of the actual skin. Extremely important slide. The structure of hair. When we analyze hair, there's three structures in the hair that we're going to look at. We're going to look at the cuticle, we're going to look at the cortex, and we're going to look at the medulla. All right, the cu cuticle is the outer coating that has what we call scales. All right, and the cortex is going to be the uh, inner part just inside of the cuticle, and the medulla is going to be the, the long section that runs right through the middle of the actual of the actual hair. Right? And sometimes medullas are present, other times they're not. So a good way to look at this is, I, I like to use the analogy of a pencil. You know, this is like a pencil. Here's your, your pencil lead. So the medulla is kind of like the pencil lead. The woody substance is kind of like the cortex. And then the paint that makes up the, makes the pencil yellow or whatever color it is that you're, you're using, that's kind of like the cuticle. All right, and so the cuticle, what we're looking for on there is we're looking at the scales. Yes, your hair has scales similar to what um, we talk about reptiles. Scales in hair are you know, believed to evolve uh, from one another. All right, so when we look at the scales, some of the things that we can look at is we can look at how many there are per unit of measure, how do they overlap, what's their overall shape, how much do they protrude off from the surface. That'll tell you about the health of the hair often. All right, the thickness of the cuticle can be helpful. And... Um, in some um, breed, or excuse me, in some species, you'll find some pigments within the cuticle. But we're primarily going to use the cuticle to help us to be able to determine between different species. But it's not going to be able to help us to center in and say, hey, this hair most likely came from this individual of that species. So we'll use the cuticle to help identify this came from a dog, or this came from a cat, or this came from a human. But we can't really go any further than that using just the cuticle. All right, so just to give you some uh, electron micrographs showing a close-up of the hair, and you can see the, the little flakes here. Those are pieces of cuticle. Another, I like this graphic here, too. So when you look at this, is a human hair. And so you can see the cuticle lays down pretty, pretty flat. But when you get damaged cuticles, you can see that it doesn't quite lay quite as flat. And when it gets extremely damaged, in fact, this particular picture is taken from um, somebody who had their hair bleached significant amount of damage that happens to your hair when you bleach your hair. So um, that's what the hair looks like under the microscope for an individual that recently had their hair bleached. And you guys have had a chance to look at your hair under the microscope, so if you've been um, treating your hair, uh, it'll be interesting to see that uh, what characteristics you have in your cuticles due to the treatments that you've been doing. All right, so when we look at this, the scales, there's really three different types of scales we're going to look at. There's coronal, which is kind of crown-like. It looks like a, like a Burger King crown. You get spinous, which are like little petals, and they look like little spines. And then you get imbricate, which is what the last slide was showing you, where they're just kind of little scales that flatten over the top of one another. Right? And in certain species, you're going to have more than just um, one of these. You might find some hairs have coronal, some hairs have spinous. Some hairs might have imbricate, others have spinous. Right? You're, never, you're not going to get necessarily the same hair patterns in every particular piece of hair that you take off from every particular individual. And you'll see that when you guys look at some of your hairs, you, we, we collect hair samples for um, control purposes. We have to collect at least 50 hairs because there are varieties of different styles of hair in each individual. All right, so when we look at coronal, it looks, like I said, it kind of looks like crowns. So I, I look at this as kind of like paper cups, Dixie cups that have been smashed. Somebody took it to smash it, and they stuck them all back into one another. All right, they have a very fine diameter. And like I said, it resembles a stack of paper cups. You'll find the coronal patterns in many of your smaller rodents. You'll find them in bats. And you very rarely will find these in, in humans. So you'll find these in mice. You'll find these in uh, rats as well. Right, and you can see here, you can see the little spikes that are coming off from here. And like I said, it looks like little kind of smashed cups running along the, the shaft of the hair. 
All right, spinous, when you zoom in on it, it's going to actually look like little petals that are coming off from it. And typically, the, pe the petals are going to be more triangular in shape, and they're going to protrude out from the hair shaft. So if you look at this particular picture here, you can see these little triangles that are jetting off from it. When you look at the actual picture on the, the electron, or the micrograph here, you can see the little individual uh, points coming together as well. So this is an example of spinous hair. All right. You find these on mostly cats or things that evolve from cats, so minks. You know, it makes it a pretty, not necessarily common, but it's used in some of your, your nicer fur coats. Um, seal hairs, cat hair, and, and some other animals. You will never find this in human hair. So if you find hairs at a scene of a crime that has spinous uh, scales, you know that didn't necessarily come from a human. And then imbricate, this is the most common one that you're going to find in actual humans. All right, and these are just overlapping scales that are, are pretty pretty narrow for the most part. And you'll find these in many different types of animals. And you'll find these in dog hairs too. And that's why it's tough to use just the scaling pattern to um, identify where that hair may have potentially come from. So then we're also going to want to look at uh, some other characteristics. All right, when we look at human hairs, they're typically consistent in color and pigmentation throughout. That's not true with other animals. When you look at a lot of your other animals, you'll see very large changes in the consistency of the pigments. You know, you'll take one hair from a golden retriever, we'll say, and when you look at one end of the hair, the pigments are very densely uh, packed into that particular area. Then when you slide the microscope down and you look further down on the hair, you'll see it's very loosely packed in terms of the, the pigments. That's typically evidence of, a, of an animal hair. Humans, like you can see here, is pretty consistent throughout. All right, we can also look at the medulla when we're trying to identify whether it's animal or human hairs. All right, most of you, from our experience the last three or four years of having this class, most of us don't have um, a medulla. It's an absent medulla. But when we do have it, if you actually measured the width of it, and there, this is something we call the medullary index, when you measure the width of the medulla and you compare it to the width of the hair, that ratio is typically quite uh, large, or excuse me, quite small for a human compared to other organisms. In fact, the medullary index for a human is typically one-third, whereas other organisms is typically higher than one-third. That'll make more sense, and we'll, we'll see if we can get some of those measurements done when I come back as well. Other things we can look at, we look at the cortex, and remember the cortex now is the woody portion of the pencil. All right, this is it's going to vary in thickness, it's going to vary in texture, it's going to vary in color, and this is where the pigmentation primarily occurs. This is the part that we're going to use to help identify particular humans that this hair may be associated with. So we've narrowed it down now to say this came from a human. Now we're trying to see did this is what's the likelihood of this hair having originated from the victim or from the suspect. We're going to use the cortex to help us out with that. And we're going to concentrate primarily on the distribution of the pigments. And then we're also hoping that we'll find some evidence in the tip and we'll find some evidence in the root because those can tell you some things as well. So when we talk about your hair color and why you have the, the color of hair that you do, it's because of your genes. Your genes then control the, uh, the turning on of particular pigments. All right, and the pigment that's primarily responsible for your hair color is one called melanin. And chances are you've probably heard of melanin because it's associated with uh, the pigmentation in your skin as well. All right, and you find the melanin in the cortex of the hair. All right, and the number of melanin granules that you find uh, per unit area in the hair that helps to determine what color hair you have. Right, the more that you have, the more likely you're, the, then your hair is going to be this color. The less you have, then your hair is going to be this color. And I'll get to that here in the next slide in just a moment. I also, the density of the granules, how closely compacted together they are, that's going to tell you about the, the color of the hair as well. Black hair means you have many granules of melanin, and they are quite dense. All right, so if you have a lot of um, closely packed uh, melanin pigments, you have black hair. Brown hair is more of a loose pattern of granules. You still have a lot of the pigments but it's a little bit more loosely arranged. Blonde hair, you have very few melanin granules. So because there's not that much pigment to absorb all that color, 
you're reflecting off a lighter color. Red hair has loosely packed granules, but then they also have another type of melanin that they produce in addition to the, um, the melanin that's typically responsible for your, your hair color. And that's controlled by a separate gene. So really, there's no such thing as redheads. There's blondes, there's brunettes, and there's black-haired individuals. Red hair is controlled by another gene that produces another type of melanin. The thing is, is you don't see that in individuals that have brown or black hair because the melanin granules will, in brown and black hair, will mask that special kind of melanin that's made in red-haired individuals. All right, well, why do you get the gray hair then? Uh, I like to think it's because of my wife and my kids, but uh, they, they tend to disagree with that. It's actually because the, the melanin stops getting produced. All right, and so once that pigment starts to get shut down, what you see in the absence of melanin is you see gray. So when the melanin is gone, the gray appears. All right, this doesn't happen to everybody at the same you know, along the same timeline. Um, that's a, once again a genetic factor and environmental effects on that as well. And I'm going to move on. We can talk about that more when I come back. The last structure we're going to look at with the hair is we're going to look at the medulla. The medulla is going to vary in thickness. It's going to vary in continuity. What that means is, is it going to have the same pattern throughout? Is it going to have breaks in it? If it has breaks in it, are the breaks going to be small breaks? Are they going to be big breaks? Are they going to be continuous breaks? You know, it, it, it's going to vary. And then opacity, how easily the light is able to pass through it. Many species, there is no medulla. And, for, and it's not species specific either. You guys are going to find when you look at your hair under the microscope, some of you will have medulla. Others won't. All right, and so like the cuticle, the medulla can be important for distinguishing between hairs of different species, but it doesn't really give us a lot of information about being able to associate it with a particular individual within a particular species. All right, and so when we look at the medulla, there's really four different patterns of medulla that we'll see. We'll see continuous, where it's the same consistency throughout. You'll see interrupted, where there's a large gaps, and then sometimes smaller gaps, so you can see this is not necessarily consistent gapping here. You'll get fragmented where it's a relatively consistent gapping of the medulla. And then you'll get absent where there's there's no actual medulla present. Alright, and then I mentioned the medullary index earlier. It's just a measurement of the diameter of the medulla relative to the diameter of the hair shaft. So we measure the diameter of our medulla here and we compare that to the diameter of the actual hair. And when we divide those two it gives us a fraction. If the fraction is less than one third, chances are it's a hair that came from a human. If the fraction ends up being one half or greater, chances are it came from some other mammal. And you can see the horse is going to have a medullary index slightly higher than one half. The cow looks like it's going to be pretty close to one half when you actually calculate that out. And so when I come back on Wednesday, what I'd like to get us to do is I want to get us into the lab and we're going to do some hair identification stuff. I have a bunch of hair samples from all kinds of, of different organisms. You're going to be told you have to analyze some and then you're going to have your, your wide range of other things that you want to check out. And you're going to get the microscopes out and you guys are going to analyze them under the microscope and basically set up your controls because then later on in the week, most likely Friday or next week Monday, you will be going through and uh, taking a quiz where I will put different slides onto the onto the microscope and you'll go around and using your controls that you've already collected, identify the, the species that that particular hair came from. So hopefully that helps to ease the, the give you a little bit of a break from playing on the computers and gets us going on our hair stuff. We're also going to, when I come back, we'll get out the hairs and fibers that you've already collected from our first week when we were together. You guys will get those out, see if we can identify the species that those came from, and learn a, bit, learn a little bit more from that as well. From here, then, we'll move into, okay, how do you determine the body region where the hair came from? When we're collecting controls, how many do we need to collect? Can you, We can actually uh, make estimates about race and gender based upon the hair, so we'll talk about how we do that. And then from there, we'll move into fibers as well, because they're pretty closely related, and we'll move into some fiber identification lab stuff as well. So I miss you guys. I look forward to seeing you on Wednesday. Have a good day.